Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your patience in uh, waiting for the beginning of this hearing, but the floor schedule is completely outside of the control of the members of the committee. This hearing is called to order. Over the past five weeks, our committee has examined some of the serious consequences of global warming and our oil dependence. We have heard how these two challenges threaten our national security, our economy, and our environment all good reasons why we urgently need to implement policies that reduce global warming, our pollution and our oil consumption. Today we will examine another good reason to adopt policies that will green our economy, the opportunity to create new jobs. We will learn that actions which serve the national interest can also serve the public interest and that smart policies can provide a pathway out of poverty and into a green economy. As we increase the energy efficiency and use the uh, renewable energy of the United States, we will need green collar workers to create, manufacture, install, and maintain these new clean technologies. The range of jobs and skills requirements is wide, but the potential employment impact is substantial. In a recent analysis, the, glean, the Clean Tech Venture Network estimated that as many as 500,000 uh, green collar jobs could be created by 2010. We know that green collar jobs are already growing and having a broad impact on the economy. As just one example, the U.S. ethanol industry clearly uh, 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 has already uh, created 154,000 jobs throughout the nation's economy in 2005 alone boosting household incomes by $5.7 billion. But that is just a fraction of the potential jobs and economic growth that the green economy promises. Even now, workers trained for traditional jobs are translating their skill into green industries. Petroleum engineers have become biofuel entrepreneurs. Steel mill workers have become windmill makers. And roofers have become power plant builders as they install solar electricity shingles so that buildings can produce their own electricity. In many communities, green collar jobs will have multiple benefits. Pilot programs across the country are already using low, low income weatherization programs to train people in the skills needed to upgrade <coughs> the efficiency of buildings. Those families who increasingly struggle with the decision between heating and eating in the winter get warmer homes, lower energy bills, while trainees expand their job opportunities. In 2005, buildings accounted for nearly 40 percent of global warming pollution in the United States. So by combining upgrading uh, homes and job training, global warming pollution will go down and the employment prospects of some of our poorest workers will go up. In America, as we become more efficient and more reliant on renewable energy, the dirty power generation, which currently exists disproportionately in low-income areas, can be replaced, including uh, these communities and the economic expansion promised by the green economy has the potential to bring large numbers of people out of poverty while improving the environment and public health. <clears throat> as FDR said about the New Deal, the test of our progress as a nation is not whether we do more for those who have too little, but whether we do enough uh, uh, whether we do more for those who already have much, but whether we provide for those who have too little. The same is true for the Green Deal America now needs. In the green economy, opportunities must be available for the many, not just the few. I look forward to learning from today's witnesses how the benefits of the green economy can be shared broadly. I now turn and recognize the gentleman from Wisconsin, the ranking member of the committee, Mr. Sensenbrenner. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, today's hearing is about jobs. Specifically, we are going to talk today about creating new jobs, a topic that Republicans know something about. Since Congress passed tax relief in August 2003, the economy has added 7.8 million jobs. I agree there is always room in the economy for more jobs and for better jobs whether they are blue-collar, white-collar, or what seems to be the latest in workforce fashion, green-collar. We are likely to see today that Republicans and Democrats agree on the goal of job creation, but take different paths to reach that goal. 
<coughs> I believe that free market forces of the private sector offer the best road to job creation. I think that relying on the government to create jobs is a dead end. One question I would like to see answered today is exactly what a green collar job is. One of our witnesses, Mr. Van Jones, voted, wrote in Yes Magazine that a green collar job includes construction work on a green building or even bicycle repair. Mr. Jones is devoted to creating more jobs and economic opportunities, and for that he is to be commended. He is also right to assert that some environmental projects will help create new jobs. But I do think it's important that we distinguish between the new jobs created to develop advanced technology and jobs that play a supporting role to green technology. The reason this is an important distinction is because part of today's focus is on government job training programs. Already the federal government spends $5.3 billion annually on job training. States together spend $500 to $700 million each year. But the business community spends up to $56 billion per year. That's $56 billion with a B. I am worried that by creating big government programs for so-called green-collar job training, what we really would be doing is simply duplicating the job training programs that already exist. It seems to me that many of the green-collar jobs require the same blue-collar skill sets that are already addressed by job training programs in both the public and private sectors. Is construction of a green building that fundamentally different than constructing a traditional building? Is installing a solar panel fundamentally different than installing a satellite dish? I have serious questions about <laughs> what type of job training will really be needed for the so-called green collar jobs. As Mr. Thielen says in his prepared testimony, with individuals who are in transition, it is tempting to encourage them to train for the next <laughs> hot job, whether that's in health careers, information technology, or in this case, green jobs. I think we need to be cautious about creating job training programs for jobs that don't yet exist. Thanks to the private sector, these jobs may be just around the corner, but we shouldn't rush to train a labor force for jobs that don't yet exist and may not require special training anyway. I do think that there are ways to promote jobs that are directly related to green technology. In fact, I joined 388 of my colleagues in the House last month to approve a bill that I believe will help promote more green jobs. It's called the 10,000 Teachers, 10 Million Minds Science and Math Scholarship Act. It will create a scholarship program to encourage college students to become math and science teachers. These teachers will help to train a highly skilled workforce in the future. I firmly believe that we must look to advance technology in order to address global warming issues. And it seems that I'm not the only one who believes that technology will play a big role in climate change policy. Promoting advanced technology and hybrid cars is the number one point in the Apollo Alliance's plan for good jobs and energy independence. And I'm happy that Mr. Jerome Ringo, Apollo Alliance's president, is here with us, and I look forward to hearing what types of advanced technology have captured his interest. In March, the Bank of America announced a $20 billion program that will finance green programs, including mortgages on green buildings. Not to be outdone, Citigroup announced in May a $50 billion 10-year program devoted to funding green projects. That's $70 billion for green projects without a single dollar coming from the taxpayers. Already many companies are talking about green initiatives, including Walmart, which recently announced it would place solar panels on at least 22 of their stores. If these companies need specially trained employees, they certainly have the wherewithal to fund it on their own. Green collar jobs will be good for the economy, just like white and blue collar jobs. I think the private sector is already on the path toward putting people to work in the green collar jobs, but I'm worried that more big government programs will only create a roadblock. I thank the chair and yield back the balance of my time. Hello. Gentleman's time has expired. The gentlelady uh, from California, Ms. Solis, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank uh, you for inviting our witnesses that we're going to hear from today. I'm sure they're going to have a lot of good information for us. But I do want to say that when we talk about the growth and innovation of the greening of our country, we can't forget rural America or those low-income areas. So when we think about Silicon Valley, think about also East Los Angeles, the Bronx, and Missouri. So we need to be thinking big picture here. I'd also like to say that a part of what I see 
or envisioning here in this new era is that the environmental industries that are experiencing major job growth, and I want to quote a paragraph from a letter that I just received from the mayor of uh, San Francisco, Mr. Newsom. He says that they're exper experiencing major job growth, which includes green buildings, energy efficiency, retrofit and service, renewable energy such as wind, solar and biofuels. Being service intensive, these industries produce high quality jobs that are less vulnerable to outsourcing. I think a very, very important aspect of this is that we're trying to keep our jobs here within the parameters of the USA. So I know we're going to hear about this. I'm very excited about this opportunity and I'm looking at introducing legislation along with my colleagues, Congressman Tierney, Congressman Miller, and uh, Congressman McNerney to see how we could better serve, retrain, retrofit are workers who have lost jobs that have gone overseas to keep them here and then address the issue of our youth, underserved youth who we seem to be losing. They, they can also be a big magnet in attracting uh, new innovation and getting them more involved in, in the new technological future in the environment. So I look forward to hearing from you and yield back the balance of my time. General lady's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from Arizona. I thank the Chairman and uh, other than to commend you for holding this hearing and note that uh, our vibrant economy is responding with lots of market alternatives to the green jobs and creating green jobs and that there are forces out there to try to fill the void. Uh, I'll waive my uh, opening statement. When uh, waves his opening statement, the Chair recognizes the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Cleaver. Mr. Chairman, I would waive my uh, comments and uh, use it during my call. <coughs> the Chair recognizes the gentleman from New York, Mr. Hall. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and I also will look forward to hearing the testimony of our witnesses, and I waive my opening statement. Great. Um, I thought I saw Mr. Sullivan. I, um, so let me then uh, let me begin though by recognizing our first witness. Now, he is the president and founder of the Ella Baker Center for Human Rights in Oakland, California. Mr. Jones has spent his career advocating for social and environmental justice and can point to the City of Oakland's adoption of his Green Jobs Corps proposal as just one of his many successes. Mr. Jones, uh, welcome. Whenever you're ready, please begin. Thank, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman and members. I'm very glad to be here. Uh, let me just jump right in. I really appreciated the comments from Mr. Sensenbrenner. I think they're right on point and I want to get directly to them. Um, first of all, I think all of us here can agree on at least three things. One is that uh, all things being equal, clean energy is better than dirty energy. Uh, we'd rather have clean energy than dirty energy in our communities, more, more healthy for our children. Two, conserving energy is better than wasting it. Uh, the Creator has given us so much energy, we shouldn't just you know, waste it the way we're doing right now. And third, if there is a way, and a smart way, to get a reduction in both poverty and pollution. If we can cut both poverty and pollution, we would be foolish not to do so. So I think those three values we all share. The question is, what's the proper role for government? What's the proper role for markets? Um, I want to make an argument that there is a proper role for government moving forward. Number one, as we move from a dirty energy, wasteful economy to a conservation-based clean energy economy, we automatically create more jobs. Why is that? We create more jobs because it takes more people to do energy the right way. If you want one megawatt of energy and you want to use, say, natural gas to do it, which is the cleanest of all the dirty energy forms, one megawatt of energy will give you one job for an American worker, one job. If you don't go with the, with the gas and instead you go with geothermal or wind, you get six jobs. Um, if you go with uh, uh, solar power, photovoltaic, you get 22 jobs. So you create the same amount of energy, but you create many, many more jobs. The problem that we have right now, contrary to uh, some of your uh, earlier uh, concerns, is that our workforce development is actually lagging and lagging dramatically behind this opportunity. We have the opportunity to grow the jobs, but we are already encountering labor shortages in Northern California where the green economy is moving forward most dramatically. Uh, community colleges are not prepared. Our vocational training programs are not prepared. And what we are hearing from eco-entrepreneurs themselves, the business leaders themselves in this field, is that they are not getting the kinds of graduates from our programs that they need to 
be able to go to scale. So it is the business community from which we are hearing, in, at least in Northern California, that they need more help, they need better trained graduates. The challenge that we now face is that as you begin to meet the workforce development needs of the business community, the cities and local uh, 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 municipalities cannot retrofit ourselves fast enough. Our community colleges don't have the money, they don't have the resources to turn around on a dime and meet this need. We need federal help. We, need, we recognize that the federal government does do some workforce development. Uh, frankly, it's been doing less and less over time. Uh, we think it's time now to be, begin to take advantage of this opportunity and to invest more and invest more dramatically. I also want to speak to Congresswoman Salisa's point. This is the biggest opportunity that any of us will have to begin to create green pathways out of poverty, to begin to build a green economy that is strong enough to lift people out of poverty. I, for one, am conservative enough. I believe in work. I believe people should work their way out of poverty. But for too long, we've been telling people in the neighborhoods where I work, you're supposed to climb out of poverty a six-story ladder with three rungs on it. We have got to start putting rungs back on the ladder of opportunity. And this green economy, this explosion of opportunity means that we can actually begin to build green pathways out of poverty. If you teach a young person how to put up solar panels, that young person is on his or her way to becoming a solar engineer, an electrical engineer. They can join the United Electrical Workers Union. That is a, a green pathway to a union job out of poverty. If you teach a young person to double pane glass so that building does not leak so much energy, that young person is now on the way to becoming a glazer. That is a union job. That is a green pathway out of poverty. And for too long, the young people in this country have only heard one thing from us older folks, which is don't do drugs, don't shoot each other, don't get pregnant. And then we walk away from them, and we just leave them there to figure out now what are they supposed to do. I hope that both parties will say to the, this generation of Americans, we have work for you to do. We want to re reboot, we want to retrofit this whole economy. We want to do energy in this country in a clean way, and by doing it in a clean way, we want to take that handgun out of your hand and put a caulk gun in your hand. We want to give you some hope and some opportunity to do something beautiful for your country. I think both parties should embrace that agenda. We don't have any throwaway resources. We don't have any throwaway species. We don't have any throwaway children or neighborhoods either. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Jones, very much. Um, next, we're going to hear from uh, Jerome Ringo. He is the president of the Apollo Alliance. He's been employed for more than 20 years in Louisiana's petrochemical industry. He has firsthand experience uh, in the challenges faced by workers and the communities near chemical plants and the benefits that green collar jobs can offer American workers. We welcome you, Mr. Ringo. Whenever you're ready, please begin. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to the committee for inviting us here today. The Apollo Alliance is a coalition of labor uh, uh, activists, business env and environmentalists, uh, faith community, uh, what have you, who believe that our nation and, uh, can and must achieve a, a triple bottom line, and that is profitability and markets for a growing clean energy future industry, uh, curbs on global warming pollution and good jobs for American families. We've got to bring jobs back to America, uh, reduce our dependency on foreign oil, and get off the oil barrel that we've been held over by foreign countries. Uh, we at Apollo believe that the uh, ambitious $300 billion in federal spending over 10 years could create 3 million new good jobs uh, for America. It, it would be a big win, but to win big, we need to set forth a, a in place a specific policy supports that sees the economic growth and jobs creation potential of new technologies. Uh, we should view the development of a cap and trade system as an opportunity to create major job investment funds that would be used to develop more secure, homegrown energy supplies and create those good jobs. Such programs would control global warming pollution twice, once by capping pollution, uh, then by supporting the new generation of clean power sources. For instance, we, are very much like, we very much like the idea enshrined in Senator Bingaman's uh, cap and trade bill to move and start 
uh, the, the date of carbon auctions ahead uh, of the start date for capping the emissions. That puts the horse properly in front of the cart by creating a new energy investment fund that could be used proactively to ease any employment issues that might arise uh, later from global warming pollution uh, controls. Likewise, we feel that we should match new regulations with positive job strategies. For instance, mandates to improve auto e uh, fuel economy should be packaged with the big retooling incentives to help the domestic auto industry transition to compete in the new marketplace. Also, pardon me, any renewable energy standard uh, will be more attractive if, it, if it's matched with loan guarantees for renewable in, uh, industry, renewable energy manufacturing. That way we create jobs manufacturing wind turbines and solar panels at the same time uh, the RES grows and the market uh, for renewable power. Our analysis, our analysis estimates that a $300 billion investment will return $306 billion to the Treasury at the end of 10 years, so it pays for itself. And just a few suggestions on how we can ensure clean energy for good jobs investment fund. Uh, it delivers on its promise for good jobs for working Americans. First, we need to finance a big increase in clean energy research and development. I know both chambers are moving ARPA-E legislation. However, please make sure America captures the jobs by requiring that any new and successful technologies be licensed for development and commercialization first here in the United States. To the greatest extent, uh, 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 these technologies should be used, uh, used domestic materials. Second, uh, we need to establish a long-term certainty in the clean energy market. It's widely observed that inconsistent federal incentives have been a major barrier to clean energy development. A two, a year, a two to three year uh, time horizon simply does not provide the assurance that, pro uh, that project developers and component manufacturers need to justify investment decisions. Uh, and third, we want to match long-term market support with manufacturing incentives. As the market grows, so should our ability to produce clean energy systems and system components. Renewable energy is growing fast in the United States, but European and Asian manufacturers now account for more than 85 percent of the global market, and we need to build up our renewable energy manufacturing by strengthening the Department of Energy's Long Guarantee Program so it supports manufacturing of proven energy technologies, not just pilot projects. And finally, we must do more to prepare the workforce for a green economy. We are proud to support Senator Sanders' efforts to create a, a clean energy workforce development program, uh, and Senator Sanders' bill would not only ensure that we have the skilled workforce to meet the challenge, but it would also make sure that the jobs created are going to be jobs that people deserve and need the most. And Senator Solis, thank you. As she prepares counterpart legislation in the House, that legislation is, is uh, crucially important to Apollo's strategy in creating a clean energy and good jobs. Uh, the challenge for, for congressional leaders today will be to ensure that we all get there together, working men and women alongside industry, environmentalists, and our national security community. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Ringo, very much. Our next uh, witness I'd like to recognize is Elsa Barboza. Um, the campaign coordinator for the strategic concepts in organizing and policy education in Los Angeles. Her latest project involves developing a green career ladder training program to provide workers to upgrade the efficiencies of the LA city buildings. Ms. Barboza, uh, thank you for your testimony this afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Elsa Barbosa. I'm representing SCOPE, a grassroots organizing and policy institute in Los Angeles. And we convene a progressive alliance in Los Angeles called the Los Angeles Apollo Alliance. And what we're about is to, to take the second largest US city and shape its economy and transition its economy to a clean and sustainable and equitable economy and to address poverty in Los Angeles. Um, thank you for having this, this hearing today on green jobs and global warming. It to, it, it, acknowledges that energy independence is a jobs issue, it is a workforce development issue, it is an equity issue. Um, 
I just want to spend a little bit of time talking to you about what our Green Jobs campaign is, but let me, let me, let me give you the backdrop to the story. The backdrop is that in Los Angeles, the low-income communities of color like South Los Angeles, like East Los Angeles, face the same underlying systemic trends as other low-income major cities other low-income communities in major cities. Economic restructuring and globalization, so those high-wage, um, long-term union jobs have been lost, um, and they've been replaced by low-wage, short-term temporary jobs. Shifts in public policy have rolled back the changes that have been made, increased division along geographic, racial, and income lines, resulting in 30 years of disinvestment in low-income and communities of color. Uh, severe environmental inequity and crisis level health impacts in poor communities. So according to the World Health Organization in the United States, such groups such as the inner city poor have extremely poor health, poor characteristic, more characteristic of a poor developing country rather than a rich industrialized one. I'll skip over all of the, all of the, the data that, that talks about how one in four Latinos and African Americans live in poverty. With all that as a backdrop, we have, um, we are contributing to growing to the job sector of the green industry in Los Angeles. The LA Apollo Alliance um, is focusing political power towards shaping and transitioning to the new, new economy. Um, just in LA alone, billions, billions of dollars in development are in the works right now for Los Angeles for the next two, five, ten years. Um, in February of 2006, 23 labor community environmental groups came together to make sure that th that development is, is going to be green. So we came together to create quality jobs in the new green industry and focus on, on the unionization of the new economy to ensure livable wage jobs and benefits for families. And we also came together to focus on the workforce development training and access for communities of color and low income communities to lead and establish the needed work to make to make the move to a clean energy economy. So our vision is to create a pipeline that upgrades the skills of existing workers, backfills with new workers, and addresses the basic skills gap of low-income communities of color, connecting to union apprenticeships uh, where there is a job at the end of the training so that we're not doing training just for training's sake, that we're creating healthier and safer communities and prioritizing the up environmental uplift of inner city communities and impacting the public sector to take leadership and grow and show a critical mass of results to move into the private sector. LA is unique in the level of collaboration and political leadership. We're poised to contribute a critical piece of the national strategy. Uh, um, Los Angeles Mayor Antonio Villaraigosa and other city council members have, uh, have committed to a partnership to shape a new economy in Los Angeles. Um, Two things. One is the, the level of public education and organizing in Los Angeles is high. We collected over 6,000 signatures from Angelinos calling for this new economy. Over 15,000 Angelinos were educated and mobilized to vote uh, using these, the vision and the mission of the Apollo Alliance to gauge California propositions last fall. Why is there such a resonance? Because this really is a catapult to large-scale job creation in Los Angeles and in the country. It's, it's a way to link um, community members to union jobs and other type jobs, as well as to promote environmental benefits of what is needed today. So the, how we're able to put together the progressive majority in Los Angeles and in the country, I, we think that we have a model to do that. Um, our first campaign is around conducting an energy audit of city buildings to identify the sites and job potential to make them energy and water efficient with, te with those technologies, to create 2,000 union jobs, to establish policies to see the development of local green building manufacturing in Los Angeles, and to establish a green career ladder training program to connect inner city communities to green jobs. And this is all in the short term. So the, the, the possibilities for the green economy to help reshape our country and our major, major cities uh, is vast. Thank you very much. Thank you very, thank you very much, Ms. Barboza. And our final witness is Robert Thielen. He's the Chief Training Officer of Capital Area Michigan Works in uh, Lansing, Michigan. Mr. Thielen has spent 35 years working with economic and workforce development programs and has vast experience with the needs 
work is retraining for new careers. Uh, thank you for your testimony this afternoon, Mr. Thielen. Could you turn on your microphone, please? Chairman Markey, Ranking Member Sensenbrenner, and distinguished members of the committee, I'm Bob Thielen, and I do appreciate being here today. Our mission at Capital Area uh, Michigan Works is to enhance the quality and productivity of people and businesses by providing a world class workforce. So, what is the potential for green collar jobs in the United States? An environmentally conscious population is looking for responsible corporations who reduce, reuse, and recycle. They want to give these corp corp corporations their business, and as a result, businesses are enjoying gains in brand name recognition and consumer confidence. As world recognition increases the need for environmentally friendly lifestyles, many businesses are recognizing that staying in business has much to do with environmental responsiveness for consumers who are supporting products and services that they deem to be environmental. I gave examples in my testimony, but because of time. We know that the employers that will keep America running in the future, and that will be important to the bottom line of America's corporations, are those who have an understanding of environmental needs and specific business processes related to their needs. One of my areas of uh, interest and in where I've spent my career is helping young people and adults develop their career plans and for adults who are dealing with transmission, help transition, help them move through that tr transition. We know that young people will be involved in eight to ten different careers um, during their lifetime. Uh, that it is particularly vital that we understand the changes in our labor market and how we prepare individuals to enter and re-enter the, the labor market. I think many of these green collar jobs are being filled by individuals with an existing set of knowledges and skills who are now choosing to apply these skills and knowledges to a new sector of the economy, i.e. green industries. This past winter, I had an opportunity to spend a week in a training program at an ethanol facility, and it was very enlightening. And as I was reflecting this on this, I realized that the typical ethanol facility has about 37 to 38 employees. Of those 38 employees, 32 of them were involved in were traditional manufacturing job classifications, such as maintenance and repair workers, equipment operators, and transportation and material movers. The industries, with, the industries in which these individuals are applying their skills and knowledges may be new. However, the necessary knowledges and skills are not entirely new. And I noticed this, I went out to some of the green uh, job boards, and I noticed the, the, the titles of the, of the jobs that people were recruiting for were very traditional job titles, such as CFO, corporate attorney, technical services director. I even noticed that the company I worked for in college as a tree trimmer is now listed under green industry jobs. So in most cases, we are not preparing for people for green collar jobs. We are preparing people for jobs that, at this stage in their life, they are applying their skills uh, to needs of industry that is focused on environmentally concerns. As an example, a lab technician who today works at a brewery Tomorrow may cho choose to work at an ethanol facility, a true example, and the person at the ethanol facility, he went to work for Seagram, so go figure. Um, uh, so how do we understand and address these green jobs? I think the most critical thing is helping people like myself, our teachers, our workforce people, understand what are these jobs? Are there some new jobs, or are, are many of them just uh, transition or just sort of places where people are applying traditional set of skills in a new environment. So we need to figure out how to inform teachers. The main thing I work with teachers and counselors is on helping them use quality career information. We have to ensure that this information is out there and the main way we do that is through federal publications such as ONET, Career InfoNet and systems like that that are out there supported by the federal government. With students who are currently in high school or college, um, they have a 
they have a longer time frame. But it's so important we help these kids understand how they connect what they're learning in school to these real world applications. Um, we know that kids today who are in school must have high quality jobs. Let me just close with this. In closing, I would like to reflect on what a 16 year old student told me about 35 years ago when I asked him what he wanted to do. What he said to me is it a is appropriate today as it was then. Don't ask me what I want to do until you show me what there is to do. Our responsibility is to help students connect academic studies to real world jobs. Thank you very much, Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Thielen, uh, very much. And now we'll turn and recognize members of the subcommittee to ask questions. Uh, first, recognize the gentlelady from California, Ms. Solis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to direct my uh, question to Ms. Barboza. Thank you for uh, talking about some of the barriers that you face out in South Los Angeles as well as East Los Angeles. Could you describe for this committee how you go about engaging that community so that they also understand uh, the kinds of opportunities or challenges that they need to be ready for, how you help prepare them? We, we we involve community um, community members in policy development and then helping to, so p part of what that looks like is going door to door and talking to people about what have been the job barriers and the workforce development barriers. Lots of people have been through a job training program. Lots of people get a job training certificate, but a lot of people, but a lot of training programs are not um, focused around actual training programs that result in a good paying job. So we try to take people's experience and help to develop good training programs that are based on targeted, um, targeted industries that pay a high wage and a livable wage. Um, we also do voter education as well. So to make sure that folks and the, and the values that we believe in and the issues that we think are important, that um, we, we take that to the ballot and we take those values to the ballot as well. If you could, and this is for the, for the whole panel, what two concrete steps could the federal government take to help ensure that our workforce and our communities advance with technology? And I'll start with Mr. Jones. Great. Well, before I get to, those, to that question, I just wanted to make sure Mr. Sensenbrenner had asked a couple questions that I didn't get a chance to get to in my testimony. I wanted to make sure that you feel that you're getting taken care of by this panel. Um, you ask what a green collar job is, and it came up on the panel as well. And there's a, a, a concern I think some people have, this is just a bunch of hype, right? This is just a, another fancy way to package up you know, traditional work. I want to be very clear, it is not. Uh, we are talking about new categories of work that, frankly, is stumping people who have been in the, in the workforce for a while, let alone new entrants. For instance, uh, geothermal heat pump jobs. That's not traditional HVAC, that's a new category of work to get uh, homes uh, heated and cooled by the earth. It's almost like using a, a antifreeze in a house. Very new stuff. Solar water uh, heaters. Uh, somebody, you asked a question, uh, is it any different to put up a solar panel than to put up a... Uh, uh, Mr. Jones, yes. I'm going to recognize Mr. Sensenbrenner sure. in okay. two minutes and 18 seconds. Sorry. Okay, good. <laughs> if, you well, can then, answer, if you can answer good. Ms. Solis's question, All right. uh, that, that, that would be helpful. Two concrete steps. That I'll do. Two concrete steps. <laughs> number, not, not, number one, do not leave cities and communities out on their own to try to figure out how to, how to turn around our public schools and our vocational schools to meet this opportunity. The federal government needs to put money on the table to invest in us to be able to help our kids meet these, job, uh, meet these opportunities. Number two, recognize that the, the, the new business community, the new eco-entrepreneurs, they are not as sophisticated as the established businesses. They don't know how to come and interact with you and ask you for what they need. So uh, recognize that in order to help business, the new American business, uh, you're going to have to meet them halfway, uh, interact with them, engage with them. Don't assume that the voices of business that you are hearing are the voices of American business in total. There are new businesses now that need your help in a new way. Listen to them. This committee is a committee on, this committee is a committee on, select committee on energy independence and global warming. And when you talk about uh, what you can do what you can do addresses both areas. One, when we talk about global warming and we talk about work, the building a workforce as a result of dealing with issues like global warming, energy independence. 
Uh, we've got to, you can, level the playing field uh, with respect to the good jobs and the training uh, for those people that, who, that have been in the past disproportionately impacted by global warming, and that's mainly the poor and the people of color. Uh, I, I'm a, I'm, I live in Louisiana. I'm an evacuee of Hurricane Rita. And today I think it's going to be announced the, the activity for the upcoming hurricane season, which will probably be more active than last year. We didn't even get one to hit the United States last year. We didn't have one to do that. But when we talk about the intensity of those storms due to global warming and then what do we do about uh, uh, reducing that impact on the environment and benefit from it, we want to make sure that those people that are disproportionately impacted also can get a piece of the pie with respect to the benefits of the new jobs and what have you. Surely we talk about uh, in, in, in uh, building a green economy that there will be jobs created and retrofitting assembly lines to build hybrid cars, but poor people can't afford hybrid cars. Poor people can't afford to buy a Prius. And so therefore there must be legislation taking place by the gatekeepers, you the policymakers that are going to level the playing field and make it easier for the poor to reap the benefits of the good jobs and the training and also not be uh, uh, disproportionately or uh, adversely impacted as they have been in the past. So we might have to target some of that funding to these kinds of particular rural or, or city, inner city areas. Absolutely. General, General Lady's time has expired. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mrs. Sensenbrenner. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a comment for Ms. Barboza and then a couple of questions for Mr. Ringo. Uh, Ms. Barboza, uh, I listened to your testimony and the answers to the previous questions quite carefully. And you seem to be advocating using tax dollars for community organizers. Um, voter education program and electoral and union organizing. I don't think that tax dollars should be used for that purpose because it is designed to achieve a political advantage rather than to train people to do jobs, whether it's green collar jobs or any other kind of jobs. And I would hope that uh, you would rethink uh, what your organization is doing. Uh, because I don't think you're helping poor people get jobs by training them to be community organizers. You may end up winning a referendum question or electing somebody, but I don't think that that's what we have in mind in terms of providing job retraining uh, funds. Uh, that being said, uh, Mr. Ringo, um, nuclear power plants uh, have on average four to 700 jobs depending upon how big they are. And these jobs pay an average of 36% higher than the average wages or salaries in local areas. Would you agree that these are green jobs because nuclear power doesn't emit any greenhouse gases? Well, I believe, I believe that it is important as we go into this new green economy that we diversify our energy portfolio. But we diversify that portfolio with, with uh, energy uh, means that will not have adverse consequences uh, to us. We don't want to switch seats on a sinking ship. And I'm not saying I'm anti-nuclear, but I believe that nuclear has a place on that portfolio list if we can guarantee that spent nuclear waste can be properly disposed and we don't create, ad create adverse impacts on both the environment and people. Uh, and as well as coal or other uh, industries. So, okay. sure, you can create green jobs from them, but we want to make sure that those jobs are not jobs that are going to now, equate into yeah. adverse consequences. Now, that, that's, that's fair enough. Uh, uh, we do have a cap and trade system uh, in existence in Europe, and one can buy carbon credits uh, from that. The bottom has dropped out of the carbon credit market in Europe in the last six to eight months or so. Um, I am concerned that the thrust of your testimony appears to be that we would be financing these green trading programs on uh, the revenue that would be obtained through carbon credits. Don't you think that's a little risky given the volatility of the carbon credit market where it has been tried? 
Well, you're right. The carbon credit uh, market in, in uh, Europe has been uh, challenged, and I think that we've just got to find effective ways uh, to generate the necessary revenue that it takes to invest in research and development, but also, as I said, level the playing field. Uh, you know, we are in our infancy with respect to what will work. Uh, and I think that it is important that organizations like myself, uh, like Apollo Alliance and other organizations, give real considerations to, as I mentioned before, investing in ideas that will not have adverse impact uh, on the economy or on this country as a whole. Uh, it, you know, if it's not working in Europe, it does not mean it's not going to work here, but it's surely uh, worth the try and worth the investment uh, for us to see if we can find uh, meaningful uh, revenues uh, to stimulate our economy and to level that playing field. I, I have one final question, and that's on the issue of CAFE standards for autos. Yes. Um, in your statement, you mentioned you support retooling incentives for the auto industry. Yes. Uh, would you support CAFE standards being higher for the auto industry without the retooling standards, even though it might cost unionized auto workers their jobs? Again, I'm talking about a level playing field. It makes no sense to me to have standards that are going to have adverse consequences. And I believe that, if, uh, I believe that standards are important, but standards should not cost jobs. And so we strongly support the idea of standards, but, but let's make sure that we don't create casualties, casualties as a result. Uh, I thank the gentleman. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Missouri, uh, Mr. Cleaver. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, th this has been a very interesting uh, uh, committee hearing as all of them have been uh, thus far and, and very uh, instructive and informative. The, um, the, the issues that, that uh, I think are, are, have been placed on the table today uh, are uh, ones that may be ideological as much as they are uh, climatological uh, because we are uh, actually dealing with whether or not the government has a role and then how deeply uh, should the government go in, in dealing with uh, uh, climate change and, and the industry that could be developed from it. If we talk about, and, and Ms. Barboza mentioned this, I, th I think all of you hit on it a little. If we are talking about uh, turning loose this great uh, American ingenuity uh, to create a, another industrial age, and, and, and this time, minorities would have a, an opportunity uh, to participate uh, as the door opens, uh, as opposed to as it closed uh, at the beginning of the 20th century. But when we talk like that, the, 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 what, 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 what inevitably surfaces is the ideological issue. And that is, well, you know, this, is this a jobs program? Is this, you know, some, uh, uh, some kind of a social program? And I, was, I left the committee hearing last week and went outside and uh, two young men whom God loves uh, stopped me and, and went off ab about uh, how much of a hoax this, this whole issue is. And so if we're talking about taking advantage of, of this uh, new technology uh, or advancing the new technology, um, it, it, does it not present all kinds of, of, of issues that we we got to get beyond before we can make the kind of progress that we need, Mr. Jones. Well, uh, this is my great hope is that this is the one issue that we can be one country about. Uh, this really is the opportunity. Um, we're, at this point, nobody is proposing uh, that the government is going to come in and fix it. What we're saying is we want to set our eco entrepreneurs up to succeed. We want to give the, 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 uh, the ecological entrepreneurs a world-class, as, as our colleague said, a world-class workforce so they can meet a world-class challenge. Now, I can't imagine that anybody here thinks that the government has no role in education. Um, I think all of us agree that one of the great strengths of the American system is that we do have a public education system and that we have invested in it. Um, what I uh, hope will happen is that we will use what we already agree on which is that 
uh, young people and displaced workers, our veterans coming home, deserve an opportunity to get well trained to be a part of this new opportunity. I hope that this green wave can lift all boats. I, I agree with you, but but uh, but when if we start the moment we say it it, it has great opportunity for minorities, mm. for whatever reason that uh, that that also. Well, I think that we've, we, we, we've now decided, I think, as a country that affirmative action is something we're moving away from. I think we've decided as a country that we, uh, well, that we see uh, the, I'm, I'm just, I, I think it's unfortunate. I'm a, a product of affirmative action. I went to, went to college and everything else on minority scholarships. But it seems to me that that's something that we don't want anymore. Uh, it seems to me that we're, we're uh, concerned about welfare. At some point, there has to be a ladder of opportunity that we hold for people. Um, let them climb that ladder, but there's got to be a ladder of opportunity. I think this is our best opportunity to build that ladder, and I hope that we can be one country on this. I, if, if, there, if we can't be one country you, on this. Thank you. Let me ask you. Go, go ahead, Ms. Barbosa. Well, if, if put the ideological aside. I, mean, I think that federal policy needs to, needs to include um, policy that's based on data, and that data needs to talk about creating policy based on the labor market trends. And so look at that from the from the... Uh, climate, climate change, energy and independence um, way, and look at that labor market. Do long-term planning for equitable economic development that creates quality job opportunities where there are jobs, where there are interventions that can be made. Look at and support workforce development to ensure hard skills training to address the skills gap. We all know there's a skills gap in this country. Um, supportive services and support overall regional economic development strategy. And that's really what this is about, is that it, this isn't just an environmental issue, but this is an economic issue. And we need to, to create federal policy that's based on, on all of those. Thank you. Uh, are any of you familiar with the Chicago Climate Exchange? None, none of us are experts on it. Um, the, the truth of the matter is uh, we, we would not even be selling ethanol at, at the few stations in this country where it's sold but for the federal subsidy. Uh, without the federal subsidy, this, this would not be uh, uh, anything going on in, in this country. I, I guess the point I'm making is that the federal government has a history of always stepping in uh, to, to launch uh, projects and programs that are in the, in the, in the uh, interest of the government. Now, I'm not in, in the interest of the country. I'm not suggesting that, that, that we just open up the, the bank and, and say, you know, anybody who with a green thumb uh, come in and, 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 and take uh, uh, as much as you can get in a wheelbarrow. But uh, do you not believe that the federal government uh, should play a major role in getting us off uh, into a new direction with regard to green technology? Yes. Absolutely. And by virtue of the opportunity, we are faced with an opportunity, as Van Jones mentioned, that we have never been faced with in our history. Not only, it, and it is an opportunity driven by uh, the events of our time uh, under the umbrella of global warming. We are seeing events associated with global warming that are unprecedented, that are affecting the lives of people in a way like it, it never has before. Katrina was that example. The gas prices at the gas pump are a prime example. Being held over the oil barrel by foreign governments with respect to our dependency on foreign oil is a prime example. And so this is a galvanizing uh, issue that can galvanize America and there can be benefits from it that puts America back to work again, stimulates our economy in a way like it's never been before. We're going to create a new green economy. As I keep alluding to, we've just got to make it a level playing field to, what, to where all America benefits uh, from, from the solutions that we're pursuing. That has not always been done in the past, but we have an opportunity to do it now. It will require some government intervention. Time has Thank expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I've been informed that there are five roll calls on the House floor. We have time to recognize Mr. Shattig for his questions. Um, we can recognize then the gentlelady from Michigan for her time. Um, but then um, we'll have to uh, uh, recess and come back if that would be the wish of the members for any addition. Would that be the wish of the committee to come back? <laughs> uh, 
Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll ask the indulgence of the witnesses to stay here then for about 25 minutes. I will return. If any members return, I will recognize them. And if uh, they do not, then I will ask my questions and then the hearing will end. Chair recognizes the gentlelady from Michigan. Thank Ms. you, Miller, Mr. For Chairman. For five minutes. Yeah, I'll try to be brief here. I was just uh, uh, very, very uh, uh, pleasantly uh, I shouldn't say surprised, but it was pleasant to hear Mr. Ringo say that, uh, and I wrote this down, that standards should not cost jobs. And you were uh, responding to Mr. Sensenbrenner's question about CAFE standards. And uh, of course, ca higher CAFE standards are uh, absolutely going to cost jobs. And I'm just wondering if you could uh, flesh out for me a bit when you talked about supporting retooling incentives or perhaps a, a question for any of you, what incentive the uh, federal government could actually provide uh, to uh, uh, devise uh, some assistance for the uh, big three for the auto jobs that will be lost when the higher CAFE standards happen? Well, when we talk about a new green economy, and, and surely uh, uh, I think when we talk about a new green economy, we're talking about good jobs, or we're talking about new jobs. And there are going to be opportunities for new jobs that are going to take the place uh, of those lost jobs. Now, I'm not surely not, not saying that there will be an automatic, automatic major job loss because of CAFE standards. What I'm saying is that there has to be a balance in that we do not over-regulate ourselves to where it does cost jobs, I think that we'll have to make the necessary adjustment to minimize the economic impact. But for those that lose, that lose their jobs, we are looking at a creation of new good jobs in the area as a result of the research and development of new alternatives that will keep America working. It doesn't necessarily mean that, th that they will uh, keep the same jobs they have. Some people will lose jobs, but at least they won't remain unemployed there will be new opportunities for new jobs if we promote this research and development. And because there is a sense of urgency to do something when you talk about global warming and the increase of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, there's a sense of urgency. We've got to respond because we have not responded pro properly I appreciate that. So do you think it's appropriate then for the federal government to assist the big three as they transition from what will be most certainly a loss of jobs? because of high, higher CAFE standards? I think the Maybe any of you could answer I, that. I think the responsibility of the American government is to assist a creation of new jobs which will benefit the big three as, as well as any other job losses that occur in any field anywhere in the country. Any of the rest of you have a comment on that, Mr. Yeah, Jones? This, this, this is a tough one, obviously. Um, I think two things. One, it is really not clear to me, and I'm not being ideological about it, it's really not clear to me that the CAFE standard changing that is going to cost jobs. I know that people are trying desperately to buy hybrids. They're trying desperately to buy more fuel efficient cars. I think that we could be actually um, you know, a, a, seeing a renaissance for Detroit by giving Detroit the encouragement to do what really I think there's pent up market demand for anyway, number one. Number two. The encouragement, meaning the federal government encouraging yes, them? Yes, yes. So you are talking about federal Well, I'm, I'm, at this point we're talking sort of in, in theoretical terms. So I'm saying that I, I just want to challenge gently your assumption that, the, that changing the CAFE standards would create huge job loss. I, I, I'm, I'm not convinced that that's true. It could, it could be true. It could not be true. I just want to challenge it gently. But the other point I want to make is simply this. Um, Detroit is hurting. Uh, the health care bills that the big three are carrying are tremendous. Uh, I don't, I, they get kind of turned into political football. To me, it's not, Detroit is not a political football. I got family there. Um, I think that we've got to do a better job of helping Detroit uh, deal with some of these legacy costs, um, help Detroit catch up to where I think the pent up market demand is. Now, how we help, we may disagree. But um, I like the idea of health care, you know, for hybrids, that kind of a trade off where, you know, we, we maybe help uh, Detroit with some of their health care costs if they're willing to transition over. We've got to be smarter about how we partner um, with our business community. Both the new eco entrepreneurs and those uh, existing businesses that want to go in the green direction. I don't have the, the final answer on that, but I do think that we should not retreat into ideological camps on this. It's too important for working people in Detroit. You know, just one other question, and, and Mr. Uh, Thalen, uh, I appreciate you being here as well. But uh, it's, I think it is clear from all the studies, at least the, uh, all the domestic autos I believe it, the United uh, Auto Workers believe that they will, uh, this will cost a huge job lost. Are, are you uh, working with the UAW to uh, assist some of these uh, displaced auto workers, which are just about to happen here with these higher CAFE standards, thousands, hundreds of thousands perhaps? Yes, I've spent the last 15 years of my life working with uh, UAW in one capacity. I've developed world-class training programs with them, 
and really have worked with a lot of UAW folks as they go into as they go through a transition. It's very difficult. Uh, they have been used to a lifestyle, and in terms of a wage, and it's hard for many of these people to understand that there's a different market out there than what they've been involved with for 25 years in terms of the, what they value, how the market values that their, their skill set. And so that the only way they'll get back up is if they increase their skills. I apologize to the gentlelady. I, Thank I you, wanted, Mr. Chairman. I, want, I wanted to give Mr. Hall just two minutes so he could ask his question, and that's all the time we will have left. Thank two you, minutes, Mr. Chairman. Two, two uh, minutes. Just quickly, uh, I have uh, had a number of conversations with the UAW uh, folks in my neck of the woods who, are, who share the opinion uh, that I hold, which is that the decisions made by management have drastically hurt the American auto industry, and it, believe me, it's struggling without our giving them any further encouragement or direction. I think that it would, would help if they were encouraged to make the kind of cars that their own employees would like to drive, not what the Madison Avenue uh, power and speed and sexiness lobby uh, and, the, and that whole advertising business wants them to try to sell us. Um, I also wanted to comment regarding uh, nuclear power being green. I hold that it is not. It's not renewable. It's not green. It's not new. It's not alternative. It's a 50-year-old technology. And were it not for giant subsidies from this government, including insuring every nuclear plant, a taxpayer insures via the Price-Anderson Act, every nuclear plant in the country, there would never have been a, singular, a single plant built because they can't uh, stand up in the market. And they still can't stand up in the market. So I, I Personally, I have one in my district that's leaking strontium, nitrate, and tritium into the, not just the groundwater and the Hudson River, but in, now into the sewer system of the town of Buchanan where the plant sits. So that's supposedly a closed system. If it can leak into the sewer system, which just came out last week, it can also leak into the water system, into people's wells, and so on. And uh, we don't need terrorism uh, when we've got uh, uh, leaking nuclear plants in our neighborhoods. Not to mention the fact that Mohamed Atta wrote about this plant as a, tech, as a uh, potential target uh, in papers that were found after 9-11. So I look forward to uh, what I think will be a development across the board from high tech all the way to low tech installation of passive solar and that sort of thing. And I, and I thank the chairman for the time. Great. Gentlemen's time has expired. Back. There are three minutes left on the House floor for this roll call. The hearing will recess for about 20 minutes, then we'll come back if any members wish to ask questions, please come back at that time. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for uh, sticking around. Um, the unpredictability of the House floor schedule is something that um, is ultimately uh, an adjustment that each of us has to make to um, our own lives and the vagaries are so unpredictable as to uh, lead to discomfort not only for witnesses or those in the audience but also for the members of Congress themselves. Um, we will let it st stay there. Um, we now turn and I will recognize myself for a round of questions for five minutes. If any members come then they will be recognized and if they don't uh, that will be the conclusion of the hearing. Um, <clears throat> for all of the witnesses, we have seen a number of analysis um, projecting large numbers of jobs that the green economy can create. From your work in your communities, what policies are needed to make green collar jobs live up to their potential? Um, Mr. Thielen. And I think the first thing we have to do is, and I'm coming from a background of working in workforce development and career development, is help all of us practitioners understand what's the skill set necessary for these green jobs. How are we going to communicate to people the difference between these green jobs and a traditional job, i.e., let's say, a construction worker? How are we going to help that construction world worker know what additional set of skills that they need to function in this new environment. And if one of the roles of the federal government should be is to provide us good data on this, these emerging jobs. Uh, Mr. Jones, do you think because Germany and Japan don't have any oil or natural gas 
that their adoption of this green collar agenda is something that comes more naturally to them. But here in America, the oil, the gas, the coal industry serves as a powerful counterbalance so that we don't make the transition and, and ultimately we could lose these job opportunities to other countries? Uh, American exceptionalism is, is always a mystery in any number of directions, so I, I, it, it's hard for me to know. I, what I do know is that the um, opportunity that we have for uh, I think you do know, Mr. Jones. Okay. Well, not <laughs> uh, I, I, at the time that, 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 we, that we have remaining. I, a couple of things which were, which were raised earlier and, and, weren't, and weren't fully addressed just to make sure that we get them. Um, number one, the workforce development stuff does need to have business and labor and community at the table. Number two, each community will be different. The green economy in uh, uh, North Carolina will look very different than it looks in uh, California. And so we do need to make sure that each community is able to design its own strategy with support from the federal government. Great. Um, Ms. Barbosa, um, what, is the, what is the single biggest problem in your mind in ensuring that these jobs actually get to the workers who are the next generation of blue collar slash green collar workers? What, what do you, in your mind, what is the single biggest obstacle? I think workforce, develop, workforce development training and workforce, workforce development dollars. So I think that a lot of the question right now is who pays, right? So is it the employer? Is it the government? Is it the, uh, the workers or the unemployed themselves? Um, so I think that that, that is really one of the, the biggest, it's going to take some time to do, and that is one of the biggest barriers, is thinking through a workforce development strategy that's, um, that's in collaboration with a larger economic strategy or with a regional economic strategy. Mr. Thielen, you're from Michigan. Sir. There are obviously a large pool of skilled manufacturing workers there. Um, have you seen any... Uh, gravitational pull um, uh, towards uh, Michigan trying to take advantage of these manufacturing job skills that already exist in terms of new companies starting up there and, and uh, trying to move into these new energy technologies? Uh, yes, we have. There, just two days ago, there was a large article in our, uh, in our state journal, Lansing State Journal, our paper, talking about a manufacturing company that had been aggressive and they make housings for cars, parts for cars, and they were just awarded a contract that would allow them to hire 200 people because they're now making the same, they're making the same types of parts for large wind uh, farms. And so we've seen that. We've also seen a, uh, a large company that is now, or a startup company that is making special shingles that can be used for solar energy. So we are starting to see that. I think it is it is a difficult transition for some of us. <coughs> and here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give each one of you one minute to summarize what you want the subcommittee, the, the uh, select committee on uh, energy independence and global warming to know uh, about your testimony and what you want us to retain in our, uh, in our minds as we're moving forward this year. Mr. Ring, uh, Mr. Jones, whenever you're ready, please begin. Thank you. Uh, first, I want to enter into the record uh, these two reports. Uh, one is called Community Jobs in the Green Economy that was done by the Apollo Alliance and Urban Habitat, for which I wrote the foreword. And the other is New Energy for Cities, also by the Apollo Alliance. This really answers many of the questions that came up, and I just want to okay, make sure they're... So in a way, I didn't make a mistake. You are being Mr. Ringo right now. That is true. Exactly. <laughs> Without objection, uh, that will good. be entered in the record. And good. let me then uh, recognize you, Mr. Jones. Good. Thank you so much. So i um, uh, and uh, happy to, to do that for him. Uh, the other uh, uh, things I think are important, I think that we need a paradigm shift um, in our discussion about environmental solutions. Um, the first shift is away from talking about environmental problems to talking about environmental solutions more, which I think we're you know, well on the way to. But the other is to think every environmental solution that comes across your radar screen, if you would subject it to the lens, where are the jobs? Uh, how can we use this to increase jobs for poor people, uh, wealth building opportunities, entrepreneurial opportunities for poor people, improve health for poor people, if we just begin to apply that lens to the entire discussion, I think it will radically transform uh, the way that the public as a whole relates to this. 
eco elitism, for lack of a better term, uh, will not save this country. Eco populism uh, as a strategy that says we're going to pull the country together to solve the <laughs> toughest problem ever, finally unleash American ingenuity uh, 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 on this problem. Uh, to your earlier point, um, I think is a majoritarian strategy for uh, uniting the country. So, eco elitism bad, eco populism good, good, and eco entrepreneurs excellent. Excellent, Ms. Balboza. Um, I also want to enter into the record three different studies. So, on uh, training in the sectoral in industries and um, looking at, so three things. One is we have a, a study coming out called Green Cities, Green Jobs that is going to look at Los Angeles as a case study. Um, also, in, as a case study to look at policy financing. We also have another study called Under the Line that uh, looks at LA employment and the training needs for Los Angeles communities, as well as l lessons from a career first program, which brought together public sector jobs with people on assistance. And those are models that we can learn from and um, do large, have a larger impact on the work that we're doing now with, the green, with green jobs in the green industry. Um, I just want you to know that the decisions, the federal policy, the discussions that are happening right now impact real lives and impact real families um, and, and on a very large scale. So we have, we have the, the opportunity to do something here that's gonna change um, generations. And just as the manufacturing um, industry did for, for our generation and our communities. And so I, I, I just ask you to think big. Will do. Thank you, Ms. Barbosa. And you have the final word, Mr. Thielen. Thank you. It'll be short. I think the, I'll go back to, I think what the federal government should be doing is bringing together this information and ensuring those of us who work in the field have a clear understanding of, number one, what do we mean by green jobs? And number two, what's the call, what's the next step? What's the call to action that we in the field should be doing? to help our young people understand these new opportunities because they're the ones who are going to benefit the most from this. And so that's what I would hope that I don't, I don't like my information to come from a biased source. I trust the information that comes out by labor market individuals and that's what I would like to see. Well, I, I thank you, Mr. Thielen. I think you're right on the money. I think our panel is right on the money. Um, we are at the dawn of a revolution. Actually, it's already begun, uh, and it's driven by the green generation. This younger generation does understand it. Uh, they do understand that it's a huge issue that we have to deal with and that the solutions are available. Our job is to make this transition in an effective way. Uh, when uh, the old economy was dying in Ireland, my you know, grandparents got on a boat and headed for the United States of America right into the mills of this industrial revolution that was unfolding. And, uh, but it kept moving along. Different rev revolutions just kept succeeding it. Uh, and so now it's our job not only to uh, create this revolution, put in place the policies that make it possible uh, for it to unfold in a telescope time frame, uh, but also prepare the, work, the workers of the country so that we can move them in and so that we can capture the lion's share of the opportunity which the global economy uh, is going to uh, present uh, because I think that this is going to become a global revolution and uh, we should be the leader in our work. It should be the principal beneficiaries across the planet. Um, we thank uh, each of you for um, your testimony um, and uh, any other comments you wish to add will be included uh, in the record. And with that and with the thanks of the committee, this hearing is adjourned. Thank you.